Good evening to all of you who have joined us today for this third session of the Vikas Arts Conversations 2022. I'm Sudha, the moderator for the session. Let me start off by introducing you to the hosts who are out there in the green room. This event is being organized by the New York-based, the Institute of New Economic Thinking and Kochi-based Center for Public Policy Research. INET is a New York a City based uh, nonpartisan economic and education organization designed to broaden and accelerate the development of a new field of economic thought. It wor it's working to replace the orthodox economic approaches by funding academic research projects all over the world and has strategic initiatives and partnerships with leadership uh, leading our institutions in North and South America. Europe, uh, Asia, and Africa. INET is actively involved in, uh, with students all over around the world, doing innovative work um, through its Young Scholars Initiative. It has partnerships with renowned institutions like Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Duke, University of South California, the Azim Brinji University in India, the Shima University in China, and the Global Institute in Hong Kong. Back home at the, at, um, the Center for uh, Public Policy Research, uh, CPPR, is an independent, not-for-profit think tank. They are devote, dedicated to in-depth research and scientific analysis with the objective of delivering actionable ideas so CPRPR began its engagement with public policy in 2004 and has initiated open dialogue, policy changes, and institutional transformation in the areas of economy, cities and infrastructure, health, education, livelihood, governance, law, election studies, international relations, defense, and security studies. Over the years, CPPR has worked with different ministries and departments of the government of India, several state governments, city corporations, universities, academia, and civil society organizations on various projects and themes. Our session today is themed industrialization and the case of the educated unemployed. It's quite an alarming and a disturbing word, educated unemployed, because it shatters the very base of our thinking. You study to get a job and settle in life. But this millennium has changed all that. You study, you get into a job and keep changing jobs. Settling happens when it has to. So we come into uh, this stage where two years of COVID has gone by. It has seen many of us sl slip into this category of the educated unemployed. But from that, a good number has emerged as entrepreneurs, self-employed, freelancers, consultants, innovators, and have engaged in public, uh, in public discussions through social media. It's probably apt that we look back into the 30 years of economic reforms, which saw India opening its doors to the world. In 2020, the world went into a complete physical shutdown, but digitally connected. Now we are in a hybrid mode, physically and digitally opening our connections. The reforms had led to the opening of the Indian economy and liberalized domestic and foreign investments by eliminating constraints, hoping to create favorable business environment. However, we all know that India's federal democracy is characterized by regional politics, which influences the uptake of reforms at the state level. Kerala's political inclination to left ideology has also meant that it was slow to the economic reforms, such as public sector reforms, industrial deregulation, etc. Hence, the image of an investor unfriendly state has remained. Amidst the growth, amidst the growth of small scale and uh, medium industries, the large scale industrial sector. More, is mostly in a limbo. The marginal growth of Kerala's industrial se sector post liberalization has led to poor entrepreneurial spirit in the state, thus engaging, thus bringing a 
huge population of educated unemployed. The government in the assembly last year mentioned that 37.71 lakh people have registered in the unemployment exchanges. Mind you, many of these people are fresh graduates and postgraduates having professional and academic degrees. The periodic life force survey of the national NSS, that is the National Sample Survey Organization, has found 43% of the youth in Kerala are unemployed. Before COVID, it was 36.3%. The unemployment rate among youth is said to be around 36.9% in the rural areas and 33.8% in the urban areas. But of course, in Kerala, this urban rural divide is mostly a matter of governance because you could be living in a panchayat which borders a municipality and still getting the benefits of both. There are, of course, I, I don't deny that there are remote areas which are highly, uh, you know, out of connections. According to the Kerala Economic Review 2021, the unemployment rate in Kerala is 10, was 10% 10 2019-2020, which is higher than the national average of 4.8%. In many of the human development indicators, we are above national average, which is good, and we're happy with it, but not in this case, which brings us to the core of this discussion. As a state that boasts of being ahead of others in literacy, education, and health statistics, why are we not able to translate these positives to economic opportunities and employment? The National Skills Gap Report of 21-22 puts the bulk of employment likely to come from building and construction at about 16.5%, trade, hospitality, and restaurant sector about 15.3%, and manufacturing 13.3%. Let's talk about, so there is talk in Kerala about the need for more, to focus more on investments in the technical and professional education, medical tourism, IT sectors, as our limited land uh, availability could promote more vertical constructions. So before I introduce my esteemed guests, just a word of how we chart this session. Uh, each of the panelists will get to speak their views on this uh, topic, and then we will open for discussions wherein participants can put in their questions in the chat box, and I will try to get most of them answered. I would like to start with Mr. Joe Storm, a veteran industrialist who has carved a unique identity in Kerala's tourism sector. He's identified as a man who's championed for uh, uh, responsible tourism, arguing for it um, to become a practice, even when Kerala was becoming a must visit destination in the local tourism his own hotel tourist group, CGH Earth, with 25 properties, have maintained their USP of symphony with nature and within the carrying capacity of land. As a person who has led by example, he could influence both policymakers and his own counterparts in the industry. I thought he could be a apt person to tell us how we could move ahead with the lessons from the last 30 years with COP27 discussions on climate change and climate funding going to drive national and international policy. It, is, it will also be on the mind of every funding and investing agency across the world. Uh, Mr. Joe Stormnik, sir. Um, Joe Stormnik, sir, I think we could start yeah, with- I have a muted, yes. Sir, we are ready to hear you. How much time do, can I have? So uh, 10 to 15 minutes. After that, uh, we can probably accommodate accord, according to our time. All right. Let me just narrate uh, more or less as a personal story and how I've, Definitely, I've sir. Formed, Definitely, formed, sir. Formed, formed my views. Okay, sir. Uh, I joined, I came to Kerala in 1978. Prior, prior to that, uh, I was employed in, in the, I'm, I'm a chartered accountant by training. I was 
hoping to make a career in that. And because of family pressures, I came here. And the Kerala I came to was, tourism was a somewhat unknown term at that time. And as far as tourism is concerned, in those years, even as late as the 90s, uh, I would consider that using the Hindi term, we were equivalent to a Bimaru state as well as tourism is concerned. And I see a big transition that is taking place. Uh, to touch upon a few aspects of that, is that Kerala in the 70s or 80s or, or to the, till, till early 90s, uh, while many other states, but I would just go equivalent to Goa, would, draw, would lay the red carpet for foreign direct, for investors to come, Kerala ended up waving the red flag. So much so, outside investment was scared to come to Kerala. That was the situation prevailing. And what happened, I think, sensing the potential and the, of tourism, small entrepreneurs in Kerala did what they could, which is small, in a manner which they knew, which is local, creating a very unique product, a unique model. And that model, uh, and to their credit, I think they could create world class from indigenous and small. And that is what we call the Kerala model as a tour in the tourism sector. And, in the, and among, among uh, all sectors, I think Kerala, could, tourism could be one of the most, could be said, is the sector in which Kerala has achieved. Kerala has achieved tremendous success. Or from a Bimaru state, became a front performing state in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the in the national set in the national the national uh, environment besides that uh, as far as the model that we created which which now I got the term responsible tourism we are considered to be not only a local leader national shown local uh, leadership but in globally we are considered to be a model for, for to, to to follow so, and in terms of what did tourism do to Kerala over, the, over these decades? At first, for left and left of left governments, which Kerala has traditionally had, tourism was considered to be luxury, capitalist, bourgeois. And therefore, kind of, it was almost an embarrassment. But what, tech, what tourism did was create jobs and create entrepreneurs. And that changed the, the attitude the, the governments have had towards, towards tourism. And I, would, and I would sometimes in our forum say that in the old days, a bureaucrat out of favor would, end, would, become, uh, would come into tourism. Uh, now in today, only those bureaucrats in favor can hope to get a posting here. So there's a change in the attitude which has happened completely. Today, uh, the dominant party in, in the coalition of government seeks and gets tourism as the as the portfolio for their for their party. So this whole change that has come about has been quite dramatic. And what has Kerala done uh, in in achieved in terms of social, economic uh, development, in terms of employment? We, as the figures would show, about fifteen lakh people are employed in this sector. Uh, created a large number of entrepreneurs. Kerala was earlier thought to be uh, one, of the, one of its failures was the absence of entrepreneurship. Tourism has proved otherwise. And uh, contribution to GDP is, ex is said to be 11 to 12 percent. And uh, prob probably outside the agriculture or farm sector, tourism has grown to be Kerala's most, uh, most involved, engaging sector and almost as an engine of development. And this is the, 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 the transition that has moved. And in fact, if you go back to uh, in 2019, uh, before that we had 2018, we had the big flood. 2000, and after that we had a, a series of bad uh, line uh, difficult monsoons, Nipah, various kinds of, various kinds of catastrophes like that. 
and, and in 2019, October, Kerala tourism announced figures which showed that Kerala's numbers were historic in terms of arrivals and earnings. In, two, in October, November, till January 2020, historic numbers, till the arrival of COVID. And that brought, like, like everywhere else in the world, it brought the whole tourism economy crashing down. And uh, I would think that tourism has been that sector which has been first hit, worst hit, and longest hit. And it continued to be so till that time. So in this, now the, the COVID, we have, in the, in, in, in the COVID situation, as we move out currently, we are seeing hope of a long, long time. We are seeing, we are seeing a glimmer of hope at the end of the tunnel. So we hope to think we bring back the kind of numbers, the kind of uh, potential that tourism once had. I think now, but we're entering the new north. Many people uh, in the tourism sector have been out of job. What one one that tourism has shown that COVID has shown for to, to us in, in in this in this part of the world and everywhere else in the world, the vulnerability of tourism to 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 catastrophes and and uh, the world, and you've shown that that need to be build resilience into our into our into the into the sector itself and uh, enterprises uh, are now facing a crisis of solvency employees are out of jobs and as we still move out from that situation uh, we see the time has come that uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let me put it another way God's own country. Kerala is one of the first states to, to brand the destination. God's own country. And God's own country has served Kerala exceedingly well in this, in this time from the mid-90s till achieving our position as front performing. Both in supply side as well as the demand side. Now, uh, it has now come after the COVID, after the catastrophe. The time has come that uh, to re equip ourselves and rearm ourselves. So I, the way I would like to say to that it's time to now launch God's Own Country version 2.0. So what is it that we have to do? And that's that's the the task, I think, before the industry, before government, and uh, the opportunity that India, that Kerala can have in its relative positioning to, to take advantage of our, our we have, as we, as it has been earlier said, we have certain disadvantages in terms of, of uh, industrial sectors that we can enter into. Our proneness to, to a difficulty of, of labor, of, of uh, uh, militant, la militant, militant trade unionism precludes us from many of the sectors. And we've already seen it happening that while, while uh, when manufacturing moving out of China, it will easily go into Tamil Nadu, as in Sri Perimbatur, Foxconn has now set up a large, there is a manufacture, uh, the I-14, iPhone 14 there. Uh, can Kerala ever hope to get that? Difficult. I think it's going to be difficult, but given, given our, the, the, the perception the industry, others will have towards Kerala, unless and until we are able to, to put away Atti Mari and, and militants, the labor and trade unions acting as, as placement agency. Till such time, it's going to take a long time for that to happen. Till such time, that the, that the hartal will, not, will, will cease to matter in Kerala. But those are far away. In the meanwhile, we have to do with tourism is the sector in which it is less, rare, it is less prone to the difficulties of those, those situations. And I suppose I, similarly will be IT, information technology, and the knowledge sector. So my way would be that time for Kerala uh, and to, to harness its, its tremendous potential in tourism, harnessing its, its natural assets, its cultural assets. And what is, what is see, in the beginning, the, as tourism developed in India, it was the golden triangle, uh, the, the Maharaja and the palace. Kerala's, Kerala's intervention was 
It was modern India, the ordinary India. And that the ordinary can be extraordinary and the, and the everyday can still be magic. And I think that is the big strength that Kerala has. It is, it, it, that is a strength that modern tourism with the people wanting to travel, to, to experience other peoples across, uh, around the globe. And uh, there, I, mean, I mean, I would think that where nature is preserved, where uh, there is our, our, our investment, human development is probably our biggest asset that Kerala will have. That uh, here is, a, is, is where less poverty, less, uh, well, to some extent, less corrupt. And, uh, and to, a, to a major factor, the extremes that you see everywhere else is less seen here. A place where you are some comfortable, you, can, you are safe to travel anywhere, anytime. So we have going, tourism can be a powerful, and, and I would think that we barely scratch the surface of its potential. And post-COVID, uh, that reality will, will probably can be harnessed to come alive. And um, so that's my, my view on, on, on the, our, from our history of our growth and our, pro, and our progression thus far, our, our difficulties in our growth and projection for the future. I think that, that tourism is going to play a bigger and bigger role in, in, in the Kerala economy. Certain, certain things that to be handled, of course, our regulatory environment, particularly our regulatory environment in, in respect of, of uh, the liquor laws stand as a bar barrier. But what is needed is making the state of this destination cleaner, greener, and healthier. And that, that requires a diversion of, of a higher priority in, in investment and attention. So... That and, and, and what Kerala would seek to achieve in terms of uh, fuller uh, providing jobs and livelihood opportunities, to a to large extent, tourism has the potential to serve that objective and uh, well worth for the state to, 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 to go that direction. As we go into, man into manufacturing, Probably, probably, I think a state and a country I would compare with is Switzerland, where the Swiss model, high, high technology, high value addition, low, 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 low in uh, pollution, and where tourism uh, and manufacturing can coexist. Small manufacturing enterprises, because large, if you go large, you, the, 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 the danger of, 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 of militancy of labor will come in. So keep it small. Keep it high value, uh, and they can you you can coexist with 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 tourism attractions too. So they will not be running counter to each other. So that that would more or less be my roundup of of the the potential and the difficulties Kerala will face, the ways to harness it. And post COVID, we have definitely new norms. And that new normal is an opportunity that we have to harness. So I I, I don't know whether my I, I think I'll I will pause here and allow yes, the discussion to continue. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You have actually set the tone for uh, our discussions, and I will take it from there. I'll move to my the next um, guest on our uh, panel, uh, Mr. T K Jos, IS. Somebody who represents, uh, who though retired, he knows governance like no other. In this, this uh, he's a 1988 batch officer. He retired from government service, but he's held very top posts as additional chief secretary for various departments, including the local self-government, the uh, public works department, the water resources, and the home. He's worked as uh, secretary in, um, in the LSTD, that is a local self-government department, agriculture, higher education, and also has held the additional uh, charge as uh, vice chancellor of uh, QSAT. Um, he's, uh, he's, he's been the chairman of the uh, Coconut Development Board and has initiated this concept of uh, farmer producer companies in the coconut sector. 
which uh, actually led to about 69 FPCs uh, across the state, or uh, across not just Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, and Karnataka. Is also the managing director of Matsya Fed, Road and uh, uh, Road Development Corporation, the Books and Publishers uh, Society, and uh, but I think this is what he held as uh, as an official uh, in his official capacity. But uh, much of his work in governance, I think, uh, came uh, from uh, very the very very successful uh, Kudumbashri Mission, which is now today a household uh, name in Kerala, and it is actually a representative of poverty alleviation. We could boast of uh, you know, reaching out to almost every home and state because he, this project has ensured that the women also can contribute to not just the family, to the society, the society they live in, and also to large projects. There is no project in Kerala which does not involve the Kudumashri mission, the workforce of the Kudumashri mission as a strong participant. And Mr. Jose is one of the uh, the what is it the the, pe the people who laid the foundation for uh, the growth of that mission. As its executive director, he started innovation programs in that mission, and today it, it has made a significant uh, contribution in reducing the multidimensional poverty in Kerala to below one percent, point seven one percent to be exact, as per the. Niti Aayog study of 2021. Uh, he has uh, he has um, uh, been the collector of uh, Malappuram and uh, uh, Idiki also. But I would uh, say that uh, we would like to hear about how he managed to you uh, to build up a workforce which is non-unionistic, very entrepreneurial, and uh, very uh, dynamic. Uh, you, you find uh, them in the forefront of almost all the development projects in Kerala today. So, uh, TK Joseph, I leave the screen to you for you to open up. Good evening, friends. Uh, the moderator of the session uh, is Sudhanam Bodhiji. My colleague panel is Sri Joseph Dominic, Dr. Sajid Govinath. Uh, Ms. Sunanda Nair and colleagues, friends from CPPR and other participants. A very uh, good, good evening to all of you. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm a person who entered the public service during or prior to the liberalization and globalization era, 1988. Almost three years we could sail through, we could sail through the regulated, controlled economy. And in fact, we were all trained to, we were all trained to uh, navigate or administer the systems and procedures uh, in a regulated and controlled economy. Then all of a sudden in 1991, without anybody's expectation, we were open to the global situ situations and scenarios. Now, in fact, even though it is not like that situation, when we are uh, passing through uh, difficult times of economic uncertainty, I feel that India is considered to be standing apart or performing much better compared to many of the uh, international con co communities and countries. But you know, the state of Kerala is immediately affected, whether it is globalized economy or not, any change or any economic slowdown or uncertainty, uncertainty will immediately affect the economics, family economics, individuals' employment, individuals' employment, and general economy of the state quickly than any other state in the country. In fact, uh, the among the first lot of firing, which took place in Meta and to Twitter, but a considerable number of but a considerable number of people from Kerala were there. In fact, uh, I'm not uh, elaborating on that, 
I feel, uh, I feel uh, after having heard Mr. Jos Dominic being the, uh, the forerunner of entrepreneurship in tourism sector, and our uh, Vice Chancellor, Dr. Sajid Govinath, who has paved way for institutional mechanism systems for startup mission and entrepreneurship. I will look into the need for fast and flexible entrepreneurship promotion measures to address the system of educated unemployment in the state of Kerala. Let me start with a small uh, personal anecdote. Uh, I just retired four months back and uh, uh, was in fact uh, finding time to do things which I could not do when I was in the service, especially the last two years during the COVID at all. So looking more into uh, academic side, reading and understanding the society from outside government. Two or three areas which I picked up are, yes, higher education, entrepreneurship, and again, uh, the ecological issues and related issues in state of Kerala. In fact, when I talk about, uh, I don't want to theorize much more, but I thought of, let me look back into my classmates and unfortunately, uh, only after retirement, I could start counting my classmates in my graduate uh, class degree. I have done my completed my degree in mathematics from uh, St. Thomas College Valley, a small town, sleepy town, at that day, 1982. We were 43 students. Uh, starting from the highest civil service to various central service, I think almost all of us were well positioned and placed. But it, it gave me a little more curiosity to look into how many of our batchmates went into entrepreneurship or promotion and how much they contributed to the society by way of adding uh, to the GDP growth as well as employment generation and tax kitty of the state. Uh, I found that six persons out of 43, or out of the 43, one passed away, unfortunately, uh, remaining 42, six of them are into entrepreneurship. An ordinary graduate class. Nobody at that day was talking about entrepreneurship. Even MSME ministry was not there. The word microenterprise was unheard of. And out of the six, three of them making more than a billion Indian rupee turnover per annum. They are in the education sector. And one of them is running his own university in Uganda a private university. Uh, other two persons doing one of the largest entrance coaching institution in Canada. Another person who has done his master's from Indian Institute of Science, worked in NASA and Ford, Ford Motors in Detroit. He quit at the age of 32 and ventured into various enterprises in the USA. Now he is having operations in India and USA. Another into the tourism sector, another into hospitality sector. When I, the last uh, three months, I was interacting with more than 100 uh, good colleges, or colleges which are established 50 years ago or uh, minimum 25 years of standing, both arts and science colleges, engineering colleges, and management institutions. When I started talking about them, I remember when I was collector of Malapuram, this caught my idea to promote. Uh, there existed various type of clubs in the colleges. It was my fancy idea to start and encourage and motivate the colleges to start one more new club called Entrepreneurship Development Club. It was the year 1996. When I moved to the second district there also, I inspired and encouraged all the colleges in that district also to start entrepreneurship development clubs. After two years, industries department took it as a program of the industries department. Now UGC and the Ministry of HRD uh, encourage and uh, promote innovation 
and entrepreneurship in colleges. I think almost 100 colleges I could interact through their website, contacted their principals, directors, and dean. Almost all of them, 97 of them, are having entrepreneurship development clubs. I talked to more than 30, 35 principals. I requested them, can we think of promoting more entrepreneurship from the campus, from among the alumni, and those who are unfortunate could not study in their institution, but in their catchment. Everybody talks about, okay, yeah, we will look at you. Parents want their children to get a campus recruitment, better high paid jobs. So you know, I asked about the parents, of course, sometimes may not be able to motivate children and everybody seeks a, a very secure and safe pensionable job because that was the culture in Kerala. And any uh, parents, any parents would like to have their children positioned in uh, either public sector, government, or corporate sector. But what about teachers? Then I started talking to the teachers who are in charge of institutional innovation council as well as entrepreneurship clubs in the college. All of them are hesitant. Then I started writing to them, narrating my own story. Six out of 42 are entrepreneurs and three out of six are millionaires in Indian rupee terms, not the typical dollar millionaires. See, when an entrepreneur contributes 100 crores by way of turnover, surely around 20 to 30 percent he is contributing towards tax kicking of the state, adding value not only through money, but through the employment to the state. I feel that having spent 34 years in the civil service, my colleagues who contributed through entrepreneurship, their contribution is much, much high. But unfortunately, none of these 100 colleges ever invited an entrepreneur to their list to interact with the students or teachers. Whereas, they all invite ministers, members of parliament, members of legislative assembly, then sports stars, literary figures, literary legends, film stars, film directors, so, so many. Bureaucrats also, of course. All people can see they are the achievers out of the education. But none of them, they all admitted that all these 100 colleges, they never thought of inviting, recognizing, respecting, and honoring an entrepreneur. So can we start, then I started working on, can we think of a small behavioral change from the campus itself? I could point out to uh, more than a dozen colleges that their alumni, there are companies with the public issue and more than 100 or even 200, 300 crores turnover. But they had never realized that. Then I asked them to find out the alumni's list. And they all told that in our website, all the colleges are having website. The most prominent alumni's list, they, they told me that they have published. But unfortunately, none of them, none of them uh, look upon, look upon the successful entrepreneurs or experienced entrepreneurs as their alumni. Now then I requested and slowly starting every day evening, I started interacting with one or two colleges and they all, I just start, started, the, we uh, started telling them, we have arts festival in the colleges, every college. We have sports festival in every college. We have so many festivals, literary, then sports, drama, film festival. Why can't we think of an entrepreneur's festival or an entrepreneur's meet and make it a regular feat or regular event in every college? Yes, of course, then, uh, of course, they, many of them told that, okay, it needs money. Uh, can we get some money from government? They immediately responded back to my colleagues who are the principal secretary industries and the KSIDC and They responded positively. I shared it with the colleges. So then slowly they are picking up. My point is that all of them feel that uh, even a 2% entrepreneurship from general arts and science colleges in Kerala, a 5% students passing out from the engineering colleges, they 
take up entrepreneurial route and managerial management teaching institutions if they also think of a 5% achieving over a period of 5 years a 100000 new entrepreneurship in kerala is of course it sounds very difficult but it is not impossible it is possible i believe that uh, when i when i began kudumbasri in 1998 the dream about kudumbasri and our purpose when we explained to many people they all they all told me that you are in utopia it is not possible in kerala do you think that when we bring together ladies they will start fighting and they cannot stick together i could recollect that you know many of the so called feminists told that it is so impossible to retain them in a group for more than say six the answer the moderator pointed out i left to the three 17 years back i was there only for around 8 years uh, the seventh successor of my is executive director there now the organization remains and growing out all my successors they have done much more than what i have done now i wanted to talk about the one unique thing which we could create from the very beginning was and again mind you kudumbasri is the group of self help group of the women from the so called bpl family it's not the government of india definition of bpl family from 1998 onwards we designed our own poverty concept that is the multi dimensional poverty and now only only in 2021 niti ayog admitted that that should be the way of defining and measuring poverty in india not the calorie consumption and the food basket and the monetary value of the food basket which gives 2400 kilo calories of energy to a grown up person so 2021 they admitted that yes poverty has multi dimension multi facet so from the very beginning rather than giving free ship and freebies and subsidy what i was trying to encourage them is the need for self reliance self sufficiency and adding value creating value by entrepreneurship of course it's a people love that this when we initiate when we thought we we told that okay it is not big industry it is not major medium or tiny industry we define a small term called micro enterprises then they asked what is definition of micro enterprise government of india has only a uh, large scale industry medium scale then heavy industry tiny industry small scale and quota etc there was no micro so we defined we defined and during the first 6 years of around 7 years of my uh, tenure there our team could help out those women from the very uh, low economic and educational background to take up enterprises micro enterprises uh, the count when i left was almost 1.42 lakh people are involved in entrepreneurship i still recollect networked group of entrepreneurship or products a single product made out of a group of networked industry units created a record history of 116 crores turnover in 2016 it's nothing but a small, only one product they have only one product a nutri mix nutri mix spread over around 210 units across the state of kerala resulted into this group of networked collaborated micro enterprises become a millionaire of course nobody nobody uh, uh, proclaimed or celebrated or recognized that but outside agencies like fao they realized the great service they are doing in 2020 they got an international award and made it as a best practice for latin american and other developing countries southeast asia african countries now what i wanted to point out is even people who could not complete high school people who are not having any capital of their own utilizing the platform of kudumbasri could create i only pointed out one out of uh, maybe hundreds of variety of enterprises in fact uh, uh, i just wanted to point out now look at the situation 
now we have some 659 arts and science colleges 132 engineering colleges more than 100 management institutes in canada and if an ordinary small town college like my alma mater from one classroom if 12 percent of the students can be made or can become entrepreneurs what is the potential and scope of this state i think that is where our uh, our institutional mechanism government policies promotional and catalytic avenues we have to create for this of course the kerala government uh, this year uh, targeting at uh, 100000 new entrepreneurship the last week till last week when we took a count they have already closed a registration of 70,000 plus. Now, I requested by both of them are in the industries department, you are my junior colleagues, and we work together. So, I my role now is to inspire and motivate and even challenge them. I told them that let us think of a network of at least we could list out 100 colleges in there, maybe a 40 uh, art and science colleges who have completed more than 50 years of it who have okay. already sir, there can, already... sir uh, can i just interrupt you out here sir that you've got you brought out a very interesting uh, you know a futuristic idea for us so i would like to you know develop out on this uh, in our panel discussion so before that we, right. could i just interrupt you and we could talk we could hear uh, dr saji gopinath also and uh, uh, we'll, me... this particular yeah. idea is um, is something i would like to you know we could we could yeah. elaborate on a little more yeah. Yeah, give, I, I, me, give, give, I... me, give me two more minutes, I will come. Oh, definitely. Sir. Okay. Sir. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, my, my point is around the 40 uh, arts and science colleges, 30 engineering colleges, and another 30 management institutions. This out of uh, together, put together 100 academic institutions in Kerala. Such institutions, we will encourage, motivate, and incentivize such institutions to promote at least a new 100 entrepreneurs or small enterprises within. Out of this 10,000, can we think of 1%, say 100 of them, to go for a public issue after say three years or five years, three to five years? Can these colleges be encouraged and motivated? As Mr. Joe Storinik also pointed out that when an entrepreneur goes out to establish in his private land, an enterprise in his private land, the external forces come into picture. We could, I could find out more than 50 colleges, old colleges are having sufficient land within the campus. So can we think of a campus industrial park concept where we have to incentivize such colleges, maybe treat their share of the land as their equity, then their equity, and then encourage their colleges. Let the, let the students from the college, while they are in the campus itself, interact and learn from the existing entrepreneurs and develop their own ideas. So how to incentivize them? I think we need to incentivize the entrepreneurship development clubs, the college management, and the students. Second aspect is, if uh, it's a wild, wild imagination I'm putting forth. If such new entrepreneurs create wealth and value, can the government think of returning back 25% of the state share of the GST, which they add, they are adding to the state kitty. So GST being a totally collected by central agency, 50% goes to central government. Can we think of half of that state share, 25% out of that for three years, if you can give us incentive after paying tax as a promotional incentive to these people. Second is, linking with the finance a new entrepreneur going to a bank i think he has to go go through a hell of difficulties so initial first two to three years without going to a bank can we create a funding mechanism for such i think two things in my mind one is the famous kifb model in kerala for infrastructure project kerala infrastructure investment fund board kifb has done wonderfully well in creating infrastructure can we think of a similar fund of kerala 
entrepreneurial investment fund that is one board second is our alumni association plus entrepreneurship development clubs bridging them each other creating suitable financial instruments for our alumni and nris with proper safety investing in the startups and campus industries part can we again apart from the colleges now i leave it I, my wish is that let us encourage and motivate private mentors mentors of course i know that mr jos dominic and all mentoring so many new entrepreneurs and youngsters similarly can we think of such a thousand mentors to help the new entrepreneurs and even business coaches as i mentioned there are 130 management institutions there can we identify say a 200 250 management teachers to perform as business coaches so these are some of the thinking which i think when i talk about we have to have a road map we should incentivize them we have to show them a policy we have to we have to work it out and uh, of course i hope that uh, i'm not preaching from outside informally voluntarily i am helping the industries department as well as some of the colleges so this is what i i wanted to put forth i believe we have to change we have to inculcate that change of behavioral change from the campus itself i believe that teachers rather than parents teachers can initiate that change and academic institution can uh, substantiate that behavioral change i believe and i look forward to have another 100 successful entrepreneurs coming out to the pub, uh, open market and doing public issue say by 2027-28 from the new generation of entrepreneurs in kerala so thank you very much and uh, of course i offshoot a little bit but of course Uh, no sir you haven't uh, you actually uh, put the next step on for uh, our discussion okay. but uh, i think uh, this this uh, this issue of uh, you know setting up uh, entrepreneur clubs as well as you know getting teachers as mentors now that is happening at the technical and uh, more also i think our uh, third panelist dr saji gopnath will probably agree to it uh, so before i get uh, him to express his views he's been patiently hearing out and noting out on all the points that would uh, probably reflect out in our discussions uh, so he needs no introduction in kerala at this present juncture because of his proactive involvement in boosting innovation and startup environment state is the first vice chancellor of the newly formed kerala university of digital sciences innovation and technology otherwise called the digital university kerala just before that he was the chief executive officer of the kerala state startup mission for 3 years and in this period he has managed to actually bring in the maximum number of student as well as uh, young uh, uh, young uh, people involved in startup uh, infrastructure or development in the state the environment in the state has also worked as the director of the indian of the indian institute of information technology and management kerala and has been you know actively involved in the academia as well as as a visiting faculty in india europe and australia australasia so uh, um, under his um, uh, leadership uh, kerala startup mission has been consistently ranked as top performer ecosystem in the country by the government of india and the world uh, number one as a public business accelerator in the world uh, incubation summit in 2019 this is all on paper but i suppose there are there's a lot in the uh, gen z who understand him uh, much better uh, for uh, for his uh, efforts to you know ensure that all those uh, out of the box uh, ideas coming out from the colleges in in the form of incubation centers technical tbis you know they're all you know having a productive uh, Uh, venture further out of the campus also shall i give you the stage to talk to thank you <clears throat> uh, good morning good afternoon good evening i think uh, we have participants attending from different parts of the world 
so at the outset, uh, thank you, INET and uh, CPPR for uh, uh, giving me this opportunity to be a part of this very interesting webinar series where we are taking stock of uh, last 30 years, what Kerala has done right, wrong, and uh, what we will be doing uh, in the next uh, few years. And I was quite excited to hear Josar uh, speaking about uh, uh, the entrepreneurship culture which has to be spread across the colleges. In fact, uh, 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 we did a study when I was in startup mission where we just took five engineering colleges uh, and took five batches of people uh, between 1981 to 1986 passed out and looked at what is their surplus amount after everything which is available, which is around 50,000 crores. Now, if you actually put 10% of that in our economy, that is more than the amount of investment which has come into uh, SSI sector in maybe last five years. So, so that is a huge potential for uh, for that entrepreneurship uh, model which uh, uh, Josara has spoken about. So, I thought I will uh, uh, put my thoughts in three buckets. Uh, uh, one about this, uh, the whole theme of uh, thirty years, what we have done, what we have not done uh, quickly, because we have two earlier uh, webinars where this has been discussed in quite a bit detail. The second aspect is we also will look at uh, how the world is changing. There are some drastic changes in the uh, uh, in the industry structure across the world is happening, which I believe is extremely useful for uh, Kerala because uh, conventionally Kerala has some competitive vulnerability when we compare with other states. And uh, uh, so use Dominic has used uh, responsible tourism as a very important element uh, uh, to. Uh, promote the tourism and uh, it is a challenge for our industry also because many of our industries follow uh, uh, norms much more stricter than many others in other parts of the country which is actually a competitive vulnerability for them so if you can actually position that as a, a positive aspect there is a huge growth potential on that so i'll just touch on that and third thing is there is also a, a newer model of entrepreneurship a newer model of uh, knowledge economy which is coming so let me uh, take around 10 minutes to explain these three points and maybe we will follow with the discussion uh, so we know that whenever we speak about kerala we always speak about paradoxes right we maybe 30 years back we must have spoken about kerala has got human development but no economic development Today, we speak about Kerala has got high amount of women literacy, but of women education, but they are not participating in uh, uh, in the production uh, activities, even though Kudumbashri has been very successful to bring almost 4.5 million women into forefront. But we still have another close to uh, 10 million people or uh, 15 million people who are still not into the productive sector. So if you look at this last 30 years, one of the key thing is that we at least solved one paradox. So today, in, when, in, if you look at 1992, we were lagging behind India as far as economic development is concerned, or per capita income was below the national average. But today it is not so. We are actually one of the uh, maybe ninth largest uh, economy uh, within, the, within the country. We have, uh, have our figures per capita income is far above the, uh, the, the nation. And we also have uh, reasonably good growth, may not be as, as high as some of the star states, but we are done better than many other states uh, in the country, like what uh, Sri Joseph Nick said, the Bimaru thing is not anymore, we are not considered as a Bimaru anymore. And uh, we also seen that in this period, there is a, a structural change happening across the country it has happened and Kerala is much more predominant where we moved from agriculture to services. Uh, and uh, uh, substantial portion now around 60 percent is coming from a little more than 60 percent coming from services and agriculture is only around eight or ten percent as such but something which we have not uh, generally been highlighted is that if you look at 1992 uh, our gross enrollment ratio in higher education was actually lower than the national average we had close to around 5.2 percent of people going into higher education in 1991 today in kerala has got around 37 percent National average still stands at around 26%. Of course, we are not the, uh, the leader. Tamil Nadu has got more. But that is primarily because a lot of Kerala students and other students also goes to Tamil Nadu. So if you look at uh, actual number of Keralaites who get into the higher education, it's more than 37%. So this is a very interesting thing because uh, in the Sudha Madam started by saying that you know, the recent uh, 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 in the assembly, it doesn't mention that there are around 37 lakh people who are looking for jobs. So I just took a data. I took in 1992, actually on uh, um, uh, September 9, uh, 
sorry, September 30th, 1992, how many people were looking for jobs? And on 11th November 2022, 30 years from now, how many people are looking for jobs? And interestingly, the numbers are same. There is no difference. In, on 30th September 1992, that is 30 years back, we had 39,64,101 people looking for jobs. As on 11th November, that is just a week back, we have 27,34,157 people looking for jobs as well as employment exchanges concerned. So in other words, Kerala always had 10% of people looking for jobs. The only difference is that at that point of time, the people who are looking for jobs were not highly educated. We had only around 63% of people who are above SSLC at that point of time. Today, it is 96%. So the point is we have, a, we have our employment, unemployment rate remain the same, but our educated unemployment has actually increased substantially, which is actually a paradox because when a state has moved from sort of a bimaru to some extent to a state which is now progressing, which has got economic development, thanks to sectors like uh, tourism, construction, etc. The economic development has happened. Even after that, why do we still have uh, such level of educated unemployment? Why it is still remaining is an important question. And if you go much more deeper and more granular, and especially when you start looking at the women uh, unemployment, and in Kerala, we have almost 50% uh, women uh, uh, going for the women and men percentage in the higher education is almost same. Even in technical education, it's 42% women goes to technical education uh, uh, and 58 is the men figure. So it's almost same. Even after that, their participation in, in productive activities in, uh, uh, is actually very, very low. Uh, it's only around 17% uh, or so. So this is a paradox which we need to actually start looking at why this uh, why this has happened we, even when we have moved uh, ahead in, in in the economic growth why it has happened so this is primarily what i think the last webinar uh, professor kannan was mentioning about what we call as a jobless growth right we actually speak about today even nationally we speak about this issue that economy grows faster but jobs does not grow faster along with that so the concept of jobless growth is actually happening much more predominantly in kerala primarily because a large number of people has moved out of agriculture. So I think it is not more than a question of industrialization. We should actually start looking at this question of from agriculture, people have moved out, but they are not actually getting right, meaningful employment. At the same time, they are actually getting educated, so they are not having the right opportunities uh, in, the, in the state per se. So this is the case I think we are facing today. And now the question, and I'm I've seen that in chat window, many people were asking this question as to why is it happening? That's basically where we need to understand the industrial structure in the world. We know that with the industrial revolution, the whole industrial concept was always about large scale industries, where the factors of production, that is the land, large level of capital, which was driving the industries. Kerala, on the other hand, was always speaking about decentralized model of growth. Now we have seen that the decentralization we are very, very successful as far as the government is concerned, but we have not that much successful as decentralized economic growth yet. So decentralized models of industry growth was not the in thing in the world as such. It's always centralized large-scale industries. So when you have large-scale industries for a state which has got challenges of land, when you say challenges of land, again, that is primarily because of our urban planning. We have an urban sprawl. We have a reasonably successful land uh, 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 a ceiling act so that people or almost everybody has got some smaller pieces of land so they don't part with that so there is a challenge of creating larger industries uh, like what happened in some other part of the world uh, other part of india as we still don't have very very large uh, tracts of land which is available so you cannot really have large factories coming in even if large factories coming in so because we generally speak about this uh, the what is happening in up what is happening in uh, tamil nadu where you have seen large uh, uh, mobile manufacturers etc coming but we should also see the type of rent uh, rates which they are paying will a kerala worker will be ready to work at 12000 rupees or 8000 rupees which is been paid in such factories the important question because with the type of support which we want on the higher standards of living, which we generally enjoy, the people actually demand much more than that. Now, which means we really require high-end industries. 
and kerala has a success on that you know if you see see whether it is thermopenpol intervandrum whether it is uh, uh, synthite in uh, kochi or whether it is uh, 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 denda care in uh, kutattukulam all of them are really success stories where they use high tech and then they have actually created larger scale uh, 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 differences and 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 those industries are doing extremely well so kerala is actually hotbed where right high tech industries can actually uh, do but the numbers are very small we don't still don't have very very large number of industries like that which is possible so this is a co condition where we have the we have the case of we don't have large employer industries we don't have large steel plants and things like that but we we will have a large number of people who are highly employed which is available and what happened they actually migrated out and we have seen that even though we speak about uh, uh, it and uh, uh, josa spoke about uh, when meta or uh, 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 <clears throat> amazon uh, uh, retrench people care let's other is very true because today almost if you look at the it force in the country almost one fourth of them are keralites but we don't have that many people working in kerala they work in larger cities but they are keralites so there's a large chunk of people working in keralites working in different parts of things so this was the model which was happening all these years now comes the change what because of covid because of technological change there is a big transition which is happening we always know that every major calamity brings tectonic shifts in the economy it's happened in the first world war it's happened in the second world war it's happening in after this uh, uh, pandemic also from a world where everything is getting centralized we realize that decentralization is the in thing as such right from a power production to everything we are actually moving to a decentralized world as such this is a opportunity for kerala now we are thinking about high large number of decentralized units and these decentralized units plus people can actually move from sitting in a particular place can start working in other parts of the world today in the, in the last century what people used to do is they will actually move from a place to a place of work that 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 is gone to a large extent because a there is a sustainability issue you are speaking about lesser uh, 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 carbon emission to travel have to be cut down second thing is convenience because of that people can actually sit in kerala they will sit in kerala they may work in seattle they may work in uh, uh, tel aviv they may work in argentina so you can see here a newer model where a gig economy which is actually coming into picture so that is basically where the knowledge economy concept is actually going to become very relevant so two aspects are the ones which i believe will drive kerala a the point which uh, josar mentioned about decentralized entrepreneurship there's a large number of scope for that and a small experiment which we did in startup mission we have found that we can actually create companies which can actually grow very fast with very limited investment for example a trivandrum based company which started in 2017 with a 5 lakh grant which kerala government has given today in 5 years is a 200 crore company and like he rightly pointed out they can actually go into a ipo very soon so we, such such several such examples we can see where and and they don't need a huge geographical footprint they re really require only a 10000 square feet space you can create a billion dollar company in a 10000 square feet space you don't really require large land which was needed in the past so that is one side the second side is what we call as the creator economy where directly you can start giving your jobs to the to the world person provided we train people in the right uh, model asset so kerala government has recently come out with something called kerala knowledge economy mission and there is a strategy paper for kerala knowledge economy has been worked out where we are primarily looking at this new opportunity which has come to us till yesterday we were exporting people why do you want to export people tomorrow we will export their work we can still remain retain people here but their work get exported they can sit here and work and remember when an employee is here he actually spends that's why the economy grows right the economy grows when employee spends you, you actually don't need in larger enterprises here many times because many times when enterprises comes they will actually have their headquarters somewhere else their taxation is done somewhere else they may not actually spend it on the economy per se but when you have a large number of employees here and nobody will say that you spoke at the start saying that kerala may be investor unfriendly but nobody will say that kerala is employee unfriendly 
we always say that Kerala is a most employee friendly state, right? Because we always support employees, all their rights, etc. So let us let us play on that strength. Make Kerala as the most employee friendly state. Make employees stay here, work anywhere in the world, provide and provide the support systems for that. So <clears throat> for the first time in the world, Kerala has announced saying that there will be a safety basket, a safety net for the gig workers. So that even if they actually lose temporary uh, job losses, which is a very common thing in gig, gig, gigification of work, freelance work, there is a state provides a safety net beyond that. And then created a platform-based system, which actually brings in the work from different parts of the world and people can work over here. So this will create a new set of jobs because globally it is said that close to around 97 million jobs are actually coming in this sort of a gig platforms. When I, when I speak about gig platform, I'm not speaking about Swiggies and uh, 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 Somatos of the world. I'm speaking about back-end work. I'm speaking about the work in different sectors where it can be at a, uh, a lower level knowledge to higher level knowledge where people can actually do R&D work. They can do data analytics work. They can do uh, uh, even remote consulting works and things like that. So there's a huge range of jobs which are available in that space. And once we bring that work, we need to create an infrastructure for people to do that. That's where there is a model of work near homes, beautiful places where people can work. It can even be in resorts, et cetera. People can work and take up the jobs across the world. So there is a newer model of industrialization where industry may not physically may not come here. Whatever industry we need to come here are the industries which uh, Joe Saras mentioned, decentralized smaller industries, but which have a higher value industries, plus larger industries and larger service sectors, jobs get outsourced here and people will work here. So this is a model I believe will can actually the way forward for the next uh, uh, few years. And our experiment in the last few years on this side, by looking at how do we support newer entrepreneurs to take up such uh, jobs? How do we look at uh, uh, back end work are actually giving a very, very positive uh, side asset. So let me close by saying that if you look at last 30 years, most of the things Kerala remain the stagnant other than the economic growth. The percentage of contribution of the state in the industrial production of the country remained the same. It was 2.223% in 1991. Even in 2002, it is around 2.23%. So there is not much of a deindustrialization happened there. It's remained almost same. Um, unemployment again almost remained the same. The, the, the composition has changed. Because the composition has changed and you have a set of people with skill sets available and which can actually be fine-tuned, we have two major opportunities. One, create decentralized enterprises. Second, use them to get jobs from other part of the world into the gig, gig form and create a completely new knowledge economy out of this. At the same time, we also require our colleges to go higher up into the value chain. More R&D has to be there because when you speak about entrepreneurship, we many times think about entrepreneurship as only as an imitation of something which others do. But today's world, you really require innovations. You also require inventions. Both these are happening in colleges. And if we can actually translate that into higher end enterprises, we have a very interesting model for Kerala to follow. And I think that is something which is being attempted now in, as a part of the Kerala knowledge economy. So I'll stop here. Maybe uh, in the discussion time, I can elaborate some of these things in more detail. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so I have uh, quite a few questions coming up uh, uh, based on uh, what has been discussed. Uh, uh, but before I take their questions, can I just ask my own question <laughs> that is uh, see technology technology and uh, tech uh, friendly environment uh, is almost like common but uh, uh, joe sir uh, joe dominic sir um, in your in the tourism sector we once talked about uh, having um, uh, medical tourism and uh, you know resort tourism and uh, you know those kind of uh, this thing. So uh, how much of that nowadays? Since everybody is willing to travel, uh, how do we actually generate employment as well as ensure the passenger, the domestic traveler traffic, not just domestic uh, traveler traffic into the state? 
uh, in the wake of uh, you know making use of this digital uh, revolution but ensuring that the local ethnic flavors or the local ethnic uh, uh, aspects remain intact the usp of kerala as a god's own country uh, which which we are not ready to let go of let me just uh, i just like to touch uh, there was a there was a uh, online workshop of online seminar conducted under the aegis of planning state the state planning board one of the, the speakers there was the nobel laureate joseph stiglitz this happened at the height of the covid and uh, what covid what stiglitz had to say was that it's about time kerala moved away from the soon to die uh, fossil fuel economy it is indirectly linked to through its dependence on remittances from the gulf and move into productive and creative abilities of which he said one example of which is ability in tourism so in like manner i would say that we have uh, uh, i think sarji gopala has mentioned about how moving away from agriculture to manufacturing i am going the other way around as it coming back into into farm sector is a great opportunity for kerala in terms of its linkages with with the other growth sectors and and the homestead farm still represents the largest most dispersed most widely held widely owned asset and the most underutilized the conversion of that into a, conversion homestead farm into enterprise offers can, can be the next gulf boom it can put the gulf boom into into overshadowed completely looking back looking into this how tourism's growth farm sector growth historically historically uh, how the farm uh, that is the 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 spice root uh, which has which has been the uh, the source the destination of spice itself is kerala of offers tremendous opportunities i think we need to now relook at it it's uh, and use uh, use those assets relook at it and use the ability of of that i think will be will be a big pandemic learning that tourism which had been which had held kerala in such good stead we found ourselves so vulnerable But every time there is a catastrophe, it's the first hit is is a sector like tourism, and the number of job losses. And uh, give you one example, just as an anecdotal example. In CII, we 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 had a series of of uh, uh, Zoom representation to government, and we had a tourism panel, and in that one of our representation was uh, that. And I, again here, citing the example said by. by the then can uh, the, the chancellor of the uk uk of uk now the prime minister son in law of uh, our uh, narayana murthy he had come out with wage support to the people who have gone out of jobs not too much but just enough to put food on the table while uh, while we 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 made the similar suggestion to the government in government in fact in a zoom meeting we you speak to directly to the head of head of government and we said we like to have such a such a system in place here wage support only to put food on the table our reply was that this is beyond the means of the state and uh, with a, with a, with a with a rider we we'll, you go to go to the gov, to the government in delhi and we'll support you there of course delhi is so far away I and mean, nothing much really happened out of that but uh the 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 reality of kerala is that when kerala ttdc employees uh, ttdc as an enterprise could not pay the wages government of kerala from budget paid salaries of the, of the most highly paid employees uh, in 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 a, in a sector uh, so and we realized that the 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 way 
the private sector is looked at is always at a disadvantage. And, uh, and therefore, you need to strengthen the ability of, of every sector, tourism, or is it farming or agriculture, into, into, into greater resilience. And that's a big learning from the pandemic, that, uh, that the weakest will, 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 will pay the biggest price. So I'm, I'm, I know I'm not strictly answering the, the question, but, but I think the time has come to rework these equations. And I'm, I, still, I still wonder, I make, where have all the Malayalis gone? Everywhere where I go in rural Kerala too, so I go to a little tea shop, you have to speak Hindi. It's all, they are the ones who are employed. So there is no unemployment in Kerala, or is it that they've all gone overseas? Uh, the number of students, I, the, all the youngsters of Kerala seem to be going out. They're all gone to uh, Canada, to, you know, to, to Ireland, to Australia, and then uh, you see the big numbers who are going to the United States. Where are all the youngsters going? Where, who's doing the work in Kerala? I can't find any 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 enterprise. I, I I've seen so many people. In fact, in the old days, you will find that you had uh, in in, a, in in small eateries. You would you would have local the, the Tamil people would come to work work there. Then from Karnataka. Then it came. They came from 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 uh, uh, where from Bengal. Now from now from Uttarakhand. But where are the Malayalis? Malayalis have no, there are no job lessons here. So all, all are they going overseas? Okay. Gulf used to be a go to, go to at some time, but no longer. So and it, it, it's a perplexing situation that we have, but somewhere, I think the in in, in from from a, from from the from the hospitality sector, now uh, today I'm now occupying the place as a startup farmer. And I see that the farm sector in, in Kerala, we you you pay, I mean I, I we, you pay in where I am, say an average wage of 700 rupees a day to the male worker. Where my where anywhere else in India you would pay one third of that. So this also is a reality. But I think that is what is providing us our our, our strengths in the high human development index that we have. That that, that is our biggest strength, that the high quality of, of, of human development, the high rank that we have there, makes the state uniquely positioned in certain sectors. Tourism being one, information technology being the other, and what is being described as a knowledge economy. Uh, and uh, so I'm not answering your question, but I think I'm only trying to say that we need to find new answers uh, in, the, in, 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 our, in our current situation. Yes, sir. Correct, sir. Uh, you actually uh, pointed out a very interesting point, which uh, we were, uh, I had the same uh, interaction with uh, Dr. Saji also the other day about, you know, people, uh, all these students going out. I and mean, initially, they used to go in for higher education. Now, after degree, for degree itself, people go out of the state. So, uh, Dr. Saji asked, uh, our concern is that nobody is coming into the state to, to uh, do their uh, studies. So, I, I'll take the first question from Akansha Gupta. She has actually raised a very interesting point. Uh, saying that the high uh, unemployment rate in the state is often cited as a reason for starting new PSUs and departments in the state. To what extent has it improved on the employment figures? It seems that more educated population are willing to wait longer to crack PSUs, contributing further to the unemployment. What's your thought on it? I'll open this uh, question to um, the three of you all, whoever would uh, like to start off. Uh, TK Joe, sir, you, maybe you could start off uh, and then uh, Saji, sir, can follow up. Yeah, it's a very relevant and valid question. I appreciate that. But you know, uh, we in a uh, post independent era, government thought of positioning the public sector as the the natural of our industrialization, etc. But now, if you look at every year in the budget, we are in fact uh, 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 selling the public sector 
for inviting private investment into the erstwhile public sector. Those areas which were exclusively earmarked for government or public sector like defense, space, nuclear energy, railways, there also we are opening up. Now I think we left only very small. And again, by investing huge amount of money into capital intensive industry, now government can go ahead. In fact, with the budgetary support, we cannot think of more investment in public sector. But at the same time, we have reached a stage where publicly money is available, persons who can invest is available. Dr. Sajidharina pointed out the surplus generated by the alumni of the selected engineering colleges. See, creating opportunity for people to invest safely it can generate much more employment opportunity. I mean, even high value employment opportunity to educated youth in Kerala. So we have to do facilitation of that. Of course, there are both of them. Tourism, uh, Dr. Joseph, 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 the pioneer. I feel that even the footfall in Kerala with appropriate mechanism in tourism, I feel that it can accommodate many fold than at present. So appro appropriately positioning and arranging it, it is not huge big hotels at all, but home-based and farm-based tourism, ecological tourism, environment tourism, even monsoon tourism. I still remember uh, one person who uh, wrote civil service examination with me. After six, seven years, I found that he is promoting monsoon tourism in Kerala. When hotels were all thinking that monsoon season is off season for tourism, he made use of that and he is a big player in tourism. So I just want. Secondly, to my mind, no country in the world reached a state of developed country by salaried employed person and wage employed persons alone. If you take any story, because a positive time I'm not married, I have listed out all of them, all of them invested in converting technology and innovation into enterprises, business, marketing and export. Only those countries could grow. Second, the third aspect is, as Mr. Joseph Dominic pointed out, the current day problems, we cannot have all the externalized solutions. The problems are new. We have to find out new solutions. Uh, creating more public sector is not at all an answer for providing high value jobs in Kerala to attract people in Kerala. So I don't believe. Second is, state is not having that much of money. Every month, we are facing difficulty in meeting the bills together. In fact, uh, Kerala being a highly secured social security network, it's unable to pay regularly the social security pensions. I think the most uh, vulnerable people, this is one of the social security. So uh, the question is relevant, but I feel that, yes, Dr. Sajid Arunal pointed out that sitting in Kerala and doing jobs elsewhere, fine, very good. But think of converting more and more entrepreneurship. See, think of one lakh people getting a salary of, a salary of say one lakh per month. The contribution to the economy, job creation, wealth creation, growth in GDP and tax kitty will be much lower compared to if it's a, a 10,000 new entrepreneurs in Kerala creating a 100 crore turnover per annum. I think both if we compare. Addition, growth of GDP, high value jobs, plus tax kitty. So I always feel that encourage more of entrepreneurship from the educated Youth, but of course, don't send to the open market or where okay, they cannot go and buy land. Maybe small land only, maybe, but within the campus or within the industrial parks, they should be accommodated. They should be encouraged. The first two, three to five years, they need hand holding, uh, facilitation, and support. Uh, uh, so, things which I could not talk, I could not uh, complete when I was talking. This. I think they need continuous monitoring and nurturing, at least for the first five. So once they complete successfully, and complete successfully three years, by that day bankers will come to you, 
you have uh, you have uh, enough wherewithal to deal with all the situations. Of course, Kerala government has initiated a lot of things where a new entrepreneur need not even take a license for the first three years if it is not a polluting industry or a category. So that much of liberalization has happened. A case swift in which sitting from your office, sitting from your classroom, you can get all the data. One single application to get the clearances from all the 14 departments. So such type of things are systemic things are happening. And our, uh, our uh, uh, ecosystem, which thanks to the startup mission, I think one of the best uh, legal and techno uh, system for startups in Canada. Uh, I even go one more step ahead. Just like uh, uh, GEM, that is Government Electronic Marketplace, even I prescribe a Kerala GEM, that is my uh, MSMEs in Kerala should be given opportunity to participate in all the government building through a transparent and objective mechanism. Right now, going for a small entrepreneur to go to national level gym, of course, there are a lot of difficulties. But if you start with Kerala, then over a period of one or two years, they can participate not only really national, but globally. Now, Dr. Sajib Avinath pointed out that there are so many companies, small companies sitting in Info Park in Kochi, doing services to various states of uh, USA. It is a small company with here for uh, uh, beginners. They are doing all the health systems for the Alaska state in US from Kochi in Papa. So, so many people. They are not going there. Only they need to visit occasionally. But development is happening. Even yesterday, regarding the chip industry, people, experts come and say that developing a semiconductor chip industry in Kerala with ecology and environmental issue like humidity and all that may be difficult for Kerala. But 10,000 chip designers can be here in an appropriate way. Chip designing can create high value jobs. Chip designing is rather than silicon or semiconductor chips manufacturing. Gujarat or Rajasthan may offer better ecological conditions for chip manufacturing. Uh, the next part is see, doing services, not only really in IT alone. See the uh, we generally consider that Vietnam is a country which is around 30 years uh, behind us in technology. But you know, every small town of Kerala, the solar dried fruits and vegetables manufactured in Vietnam is available in Kerala. All those crops which are grown in Kerala, but we are claiming and crying that there is price fall, fluctuations, etc. But That's exactly solar. what uh, Joe Stomnik sir was telling about yes. agriculture uh, being another uh, entrepreneurial venture. Yeah, and again, it can it can have a link to the tourism. So technology. See, one more one more small point I wanted to point out. Sixteen uh, in the year sixteen seventy eight, after the Hortus Malabari course, and that is some seven hundred and sixty eight plants of Kerala has been identified to treat all the diseases existing at that time. But after post Hortus Malabari course, none of the botany departments in Kerala ventured into list out more plants and which can produce medicines for the new generation diseases. Wonderful medications possible for uh, the lifestyle diseases from the flora, flora from yes. Kerala. But you know, our higher education, uh, Dr. Sajid Govinad also pointed out, looking into more research from the campus to address the problems of entrepreneurship and industry. So I always feel that the era of public sector is already we left. And uh, if a state is going to create more and more public sector, I think we'll be uh, again failing in creating or generating more uh, uh, employment for the educated youth and high value jobs. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Saji, uh, I think I will just skip that question. Maybe you can just add it into it. But I wanted to ask another question, which was uh, put forth by Austin Paul. He asks, uh, can uh, skill development play a vital role in Kerala's youth employment rate? If so, what are the most crucial sectors the state can look at? Uh, also, in uh, while on the skill development, uh, there is another question uh, from... Uh, Another person, which 
talks on the same uh, yeah or, or, or on a related question is that the number of uh, female we, which you mentioned about the uh, women on un unemployment un i mean qualified women are more on un unemployed so uh, is that actually going to you know lead to some kind of a gender disparity in the job market and if so how could we overcome it the skill as well as uh, whether it is actually impacting the gender also in that um, aspect and uh, a skill i asked yeah. you specifically is because you were actually interacting with the college uh, group so you really uh, you must be getting a lot of feedback on the kind of uh, what the industry expects and what is the academia giving you so which we come back to this inter uh, the industry academia importance of this whole uh, uh see uh, when you look at the skill uh, i just wanted to put a point here and uh, come to the specific question see if you look at uh, we generally used to hear about this common thing no our kids are not employable they are uh, they are not colleges are not giving them what they really have to uh, succeed and all but look at this all of us sitting here came from this ecosystem and like uh, josar said from a small college in pale people have actually grown to the across the world which means our education system is actually not bad the education system actually has prepared us to rule the world but the and if you look at across uh, across the major positions whether right from an isro chairman to uh, maybe the imf uh, uh, economy head this actually came from our ecosystem so so our education system actually provided enough impetus for people to succeed in life but what it has not given is to succeed on day one the they are we don't prepare people to be employable on day one and that in the past industry was doing so you get into a job industry will tune you then you become employable per se the new world cannot have that luxury because today the technology is changing so fast what industry requires is people who will be in if you use the it word billable on day one itself they should be day one professionals but at the same time they should also be lifelong learners which our knowledge universities are good at now this is basically the catch of skilling what happened is many times today there is a huge rush for skilling what people think that let's not study in colleges let us do a skill course and get into a job yes they get a job but they will not go in places in the days to come so what is required is that we need to combine knowledge and skills in the colleges itself and the colleges have to think that knowledge is separate and skill is separate that world is gone the world should have both of them together and that is something which is a requirement not only for kerala for other parts also but kerala it is much more relevant because when you are looking at higher end jobs entrepreneurship jobs etc skill and knowledge becomes a very very important thing but having said that we still don't have a large number of skilling infrastructure in the state if you take all our skilling infrastructure we can hardly skill around 100 100 150000 people per year but we our requirement is much much more than that so that is an area where i think uh, some of the attempts are being happening we need to reorient our teachers who can actually provide uh, knowledge plus skilling how do they do it they should know what is happening in industry most of the teachers don't know what is happening in industry because they are never exposed to industry so we don't have a model of doing that so that in the knowledge economy mission we specifically speak saying that can teachers go for one year internship in industries not students teachers go in one year internship in industries so they will understand what is what is happening in industry when they come back they will be able to provide both skills and the knowledge to them so that is i think is uh, is my answer to that skilling point and that's very important because without skill we cannot really achieve any of those things as such but skill alone will not make you successful in a long run the other side of it is about the women entrepreneurship which is i think josar is a right person to say that because he has actually showed that how Uh, you can actually convert a, a unutilized resource into really a great resource as such there is other set of people who are not necessarily bpl or poverty but next level they are economically deprived but they they still are dependent on maybe a spouse or a family for the wealth but they are economically deprived in a in a, in a true sense these are this will be around 80 to 90 lakh people this people if you look at even 10% of them get converted into entrepreneurship you can see the amount of wealth it will create to the state 
And I think there are attempts being done, even digital university is doing something about women entrepreneurship, not in small numbers. You know, you need to think about creating 10,000 women entrepreneurs or 100,000 women entrepreneurs. That's the type of scale in which we need to uh, do on that. And there are other attempts also being done at different places, but that's a very important thing. And with the new world where you can work near your home, you can create a decentralized enterprises. I think which work-life balance can be much more than what happened in the past. Uh, we will be able to unleash uh, that potential also is what I believe. And I believe that it, that could be a key agenda for the state into the days to come. And uh, what Jose Dominic Sar said about uh, uh, homestead uh, conversion into homestead tourism. Because if you look at most of the homestead farming is actually done by women. Now, if you actually provide them a little bit more of technical skills, a little bit more of support, all of them become tourism entrepreneurs also. So you are suddenly seeing a newer level of uh, you know, development which is possible. So such sort of uh, models are actually the ones which we can actually look at uh, <coughs> addressing this issue of gender disparity <coughs> in the entrepreneurship space. Uh, while on uh, that agriculture uh, uh, becoming one of the you know, uh, potential uh, job generation, I just wanted to you know, put across a, once during an interaction with an FAO uh, expert uh, at a, on the sidelines of a fisheries conference, I think. So he was telling me that uh, uh, the women and the fisherwomen community, the coastal communities in China, mostly uh, women driven uh, kind of uh, this thing. And so they actually manage the aquaculture for, the, uh, for Jap Japan. So Jap Japan gets its fresh fish from the farms of China, and like um, and and it's completely monitored. Uh, they have the sustainable solutions, and uh, but it is the women at this end who manage the economy. And uh, so uh, this, this there's this question now uh, which uh, which uh, uh, was put forth by uh, I think. Uh, Uh, yeah, uh, one, uh, oh, he has not given his name. He says, uh, Mr. Joe Dominic uh, brings up a very interesting point about encouraging entrepreneurship in agriculture and agri-tech startups. Would like to hear Mr. T.K. Joseph and Mr. Saji Gopinath's views and ideas on encouraging agri-tech agri and clean energy startups. So clean energy is, uh, is already making its advent in uh, the transport sector, uh, it's influencing. Uh, so in, in our vertical growth economy also, we will be expecting to see uh, a lot of uh, clean energy solutions because uh, environment impact assessment is going to be uh, driving a lot of, um, uh, you know, whether the projects will work in Kerala or not. Uh, so I, I, I think, uh, uh, Mr. Jos, uh, TK Jos, would you like to take upon this? Um, yeah, in fact, uh, one of the participants mentioned this. I would also like to link it to your earlier point about, uh, you know, entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneur clubs in uh, uh, this thing. So it's not just technology, you know, there are a lot of students who are doing arts, arts, uh, studying arts. So that is a population which also needs to, you know, uh, think of uh, potential job uh, opportunities. So it's not, it cannot be just only the engineering, the techno people only get their uh, this thing. So let's also probably look at whether these kind of these uh, students will have a potential in sectors, uh, clean energy solutions, uh, agri, agri tech, tourism, etc. No, uh, I, I like that question. In fact, uh, see, it is not the subject which you learn always help you except IT or uh, engineering. See, many of our entrepreneurs come from various uh, various sectors of education. In fact, a funny uh, one student, when I was addressing a graduate uh, batch, one student asked me, sir, have you studied the geometry in, uh, tried hard to prove certain theorems in geometry in my eighth, ninth, and 10th class, integration and differential calculus in ninth standard. I am now into a different stream of uh, learning. So uh, what he was asking is, in our school system, especially up to 10th standard, we have to, we have to think of 
through our uh, uh, say vocational higher secondary vocational system or something identifying appropriate crops and appropriate locally available technologies to process see what is the problem with agricultural crop one is yes perishability seasonality if you do not process them or uh, reform it into uh, a uh, capable quality and packing it package it uh, with uh, attractiveness to market it doesn't need uh, engineering um, uh, engineering support alone in fact dr sajeev govanad was mentioning about uh, the synthetic industrial chemicals the initial promoter was not an engineer he was not a chemist but he used to take chemistry post graduate from a nearby college every year campus recruitment when nobody was thinking of campus recruitment in canada similarly many of the eastern group the founder of the group he was not he neither get the fortune of going to the college and starting his enterprise globally globally competitive so what i want to say is i'm not talking about the spice promotion or huge capital investment what i was talking about is modern clean way of processing our agricultural product especially tropical agricultural products except the jackfruit which recently because of uh, uh, mr james jo james coming from microsoft encouraging promoting and facilitating otherwise other crops other crops nobody looked into seriously what i feel is many of our teachers at the high school and higher secondary classes are now post graduate in the appropriate science stream many phd holders in our higher secondary school so the school system uh, if you keep apart little bit more for vocational research and again the great models of germany for starting vocational stream from after 7th standard 8 to 12th standard they make you uh, suitable for uh, uh, industry and of course at the same time those who wanted to go for higher education i'm not talking about immediately converting it but through either science club or nature club or agriculture club etc from school days onwards we can teach the children second aspect is many colleges as dr sajeev has pointed out many of the educated women who are the homemakers if they can be trained with they may not be able to go far away places but we have to bring the technology and training to the nearby colleges fortunately in 38000 square kilometers of kerala there are more than 1000 near 2000 colleges so everybody's doorstep there are educational institutions apart from preparing students for the graduation in botany or zoology or even economics or commerce economics or commerce a collective uh, multi departmental team of teachers can take up training campuses and many people and again it's again a collective uh, aggregation of the process, product and then marketing nowadays uh, nowadays even good business entrepreneurs sell through uh, e-commerce so uh, earlier 10 years back when i started talking about entrepreneurship everybody asked about market marketing okay india day before yesterday reached a population of 140 1.5 crore if we cannot sell in the second largest populous country in india where else we will sell and of course within two years we will become the top so what i want to say is the products and services which are needed in our state other states in the country we have to survey study and the agricultural issue uh, i will uh, government of india in fact initiated a system called national institute of technology entrepreneurship and management nipt the last 10 years i was requesting our agriculture department at least let us think of having a regional center of the nift of karnataka and tamil nadu already has they are bringing lot of technology research at post graduate and graduate courses similarly our it is not that kerala agriculture university has lot of technology they are giving lot of training even today while i was coming for this meeting they called me and told that 21 training in appropriate for technology is happening now in kerala agriculture university so the problem is putting everything together and i feel that academic institutions can be the pivotal points where this can converge the third aspect i wanted to mention is the even the new clean energy startup of course i wanted to talk about this 
when uh, internal combustion engines change to electric vehicles and then to uh, solar powered or hydrogen powered powered vehicles we have a lot of opportunities in fact uh, new and emerging technologies if it becomes successful a very clean industry clean type of industry unpolluting industries are possible in kerala Now think of a situation. I just make a paradox again. As Dr. Sir Jesus has pointed out, we have 136 engineering colleges in Kerala. Around 100 of them are having mechanical departments, but none of them have an automobile workshop there. I am thinking and dreaming of every engineering college with a mechanical department on the roadside, establishing a 24 by 7, 365 days open workshop because you know. Kerala is a state with the highest per capita car survey. One fourth of the population has a car. That is, two fifty-four cars per thousand population in Kerala. Not even car, not even metros. But we don't have sufficient, we don't have sufficient uh, 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 workshops. And again, students also get hands-on experience. Then uh, the last point I wanted to mention is this is in fact. Uh, Uh, change the culture of encouraging and promoting an entrepreneur, either at home, society, or college. See, when you are encouraged and motivated, facilitated, then you will attract, get attracted to such things. But you know, only hundred percent result in schools, hundred percent A plus and rank and grade. Then of course, children are also parents are also oriented to those things. Some sort of government. Initiation is needed, but at the same time, academic institutions and the students, even alumni. Uh, why I did not take the case of Thailand or I did not take the case of China or Japan or Germany or Switzerland. I know there are small uh, type cocoa growers in Kerala. Produce half produce uh, half processed cocoa powder. They are giving to uh, Switzerland and Belgium and importing chocolate. I think nothing prevents us from okay, Kerala is the second or third largest cocoa grower in the state in the country. So these are all small technologies, not a very high tech issue. Uh, anybody studying, anybody who studied at plus two can, in fact, venture. But they need appropriate training. And Dr. Sajid Govindar pointed out uh, the current day employers look for uh, immediately day one onwards workable force. But you know. A lot of food craft technology institutes were there. They only teach pickle making, jam and jelly. Then maximum cookies and bread, no other things. So we have to rethink it. I am very sure that little bit of reorientation of some of our food craft institute, colleges with the botany and zoology department, even a higher secondary school can help in this agri tech startups and. Okay, we started with IT, then we moved to fintech, agri tech, solar tech, so many. Now it is a fancy word to add a tech to everything. Even our grandmas, great grandmas, used to do a lot of food processing at home. Maybe half a half a century back, Mr. Joseph Dominic may be remembering. From our side of the country, almost all the perishable fruits were used to be converted for use for one year, isn't it? So. <laughs> But we lost that. We lost that process. But of course, we can do it in a. Uh, we can do it in a, a little more clean hygiene environment. And by the women, I agree. Uh, girls participate more in uh, schools, colleges. Succeed uh, uh, boys in getting ranks, and even many of the organized sector employment. Organized sector employment, whether teaching. Or secretary job or bank job, etc. Women are coming in a big numbers. But as one of the question, uh, one of the participant pointed out, their participation at the higher level and technical level is little lower. But I think we have to encourage. When I talked about more uh, more entrepreneurship, what I mean is uh, uh, equitable share to the uh, 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 women also. Equitable share means they may have a little bit of difficulty, unlike. Men for the mobility part, going far away places, they may have little difficulty if they are having to look after their family. So we have to provide them opportunity at their doorstep. But collection marketing should be different. Thank you.
डॉक्टर साजी टू दैट क्वेश्चन कैन आई जस्ट एड वन मोर वन बाय मिस्टर हरि कुमार एस एल ही हैज आस स्पेसिफिकली टू यू Uh, some progress related to the small scale industry in kerala sir um, when we were uh, taking on from what uh, jo sir had just uh, mentioned about uh, the film startups and uh, agri agri sector which i was asking about so um, how can we you know digitize this you know um, link this uh, into you know make it into you know a cluster out Uh, you know because a challenge is always that you have a good electronic industry but you don't have a mechanical industry supporting it or you don't have a, um, a, a civic uh, civil uh, engineering group uh, you know working with it so so that cluster uh, factor also is a challenge uh, i think uh, even when i when uh, jo sir was talking about the uh, workshop uh, issues Uh, i remember a lot of college students often telling that you know they have done the software part of the project but we are yet to get the mechanical people into it so the same primary uh, so challenge of bringing in these clusters bringing in inter disciplinary uh, groups uh, to uh, work out uh, a very you know a, a prototype solutions uh, in whatever way you can take it software or hardware uh see what this is actually a, a real challenge because uh, um, uh, the industry uh, also has a nature that you no know, industry breeds industries so when you have a large industries it actually brings a lot of ancillary industries around and that create an industrial ecosystem so uh, one thing which we failed is that we have not created an industrial ecosystem uh, even though we had some chemical industries at some point of time we didn't really created an industrial ecosystem in any of the areas uh, so that is basically where the challenge comes as such but then um, i mean now we cannot think about that because you know many of the other regions in the country has actually advanced so there is a so you, you can still get things done at mysore or bangalore at a much lower cost than what you can do it in you know, maybe kochi or other places so uh, so it, it's important for us to understand and formulate what we can do here and then source some of this from outside that is a Uh, uh, uh best way and also start looking at some of the cluster space for example is a great area where we have a cluster which is uh, possibility is there and because of isro's presence we can do it so some of those clusters definitely can be there and uh, in other cases do the core over here and some of the peripherals you may do it from the other areas per se i just want to add to what uh, josar spoke about uh, agri tech because uh, especially i think that person was asking about what is the support you are getting both for uh, agri tech startups as well as for clean tech there is a uh, support system available in the state at the agriculture university there are two programs which is running where uh, agri com- agri companies are actually being given grants uh, handhold support and at and uh, uh, other technology support also and for clean tech kerala has started a uh, accelerator with uh, undp specifically for uh, sdg technology specifically on uh, clean tech technologies and state has also come out with a scheme that up to a crore can be given without collaterals if you are working on any of the clean tech areas per se so unfortunately many of these are not known to people right because uh, the the information dissemination on these are actually many times not uh, valid and josar earlier spoke about a creating an entrepreneurship fund in fact we already have a fund which is called uh, the fund of fund up to 1000 crore is available for startups and we have uh, uh, some such startups which have very very successfully invested and one of them is an agri tech startup obviously not started with an agriculture person but by an engineer which is actually doing very well so that fund is also available so kerala has actually created multiple uh, this sort of an ecosystem in the startup and uh, the newer sme space uh, and earlier it has been spoken that one lakh sme is planning to be in the in the this year and the, in the new industry policy which is draft is available which also is a very very for, uh, for uh, proactive policy which i think is been put where uh, at all levels of smes the support systems are actually being designed so these things if we can actually translate into action i think uh, 30 years later when we are going to discuss about what happened in the next 30 years we will actually have a very very different picture to uh, paint that's what i believe uh, in the days to come so i think uh, the time is almost uh, over we are 8 o'clock i think uh, i am due to wind up 
So I will, uh, the discussion as uh, Dr. Saji said, that it's not over. We, another have, we have another 30 years to look at, look forward into. Uh, so I'll just end on a very human note. Uh, so I will discuss figures and percentages in each of our mind. There is this uncomfortable thought. No family is at peace seeing its young daughter or son academically qualified and not employed. It's not good for the state, it's not good for the family, and it's not good for the individual. So if, if we need to equip our educated unemployed to become employable on day one, I think we should start uh, setting the ball uh, rolling uh, towards not like Dr. TK, like uh, Dr. Saji said that we need to work on our skills, uh, equipping our skills at the school and the college level. And um, like uh, like uh, what Mr. TK Joe said that uh, where you tap is right there in the campuses where you bring, bring out campus clusters. You have, uh, you use the neighborhood colleges as ways to equip uh, the uh, men and women uh, into uh, different areas of uh, uh, specialization where you start, where you hopefully generate uh, mentor teachers who are, uh, who have the capability to tap into this and give these ideas out, you know, think, encourage this uh, thinking out of the box. So uh, on that note, I think I would like to thank all the panelists. You are, um, you have actually covered a large area of uh, this main concern in uh, in, uh, in Kerala. That is the the educated unemployed. And uh, I I hope I the panelists have actually uh, enjoyed the session because uh, for me as a as a working journalist, it has been a huge <laughs> learning process. I have so many figures to to. <laughs> look back into and you know uh, start to working on my articles uh joe's dominic sir it has been uh, once again it's been a enlightening experience uh, you are somebody who is an inspiration because you started talking of uh, responsible tourism sustainable solutions in a sector when we have we and when we were not even thinking about it and you 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 had that forethought and uh, it's thanks to uh, you know people like you who ensured that tourism uh, sector does not get polluted uh, so fast though uh, of course uh, we have our own issues but we are not like somebody like one of us said that we are not still so bad back and uh, dr saji i uh, we are definitely looking forward to uh, seeing more of your uh, uh, projects coming out tk sir, you are uh, already there you are already involved with the campuses so uh, we all will be looking forward to hearing a lot more from all of you. Thank you so much. I would like to thank uh, CPPR and uh, uh, INET for, uh, you know, uh, inviting me to host this session. Uh, thank you so much.